your new mailboxes, your email boxes with the information on how to set them up and everything. I emailed that to everyone so you guys should have that. Stephanie, you can hand that to the Dorsey. That's your account. That's the number on the top. Seven, six, man, you got me jumping up and down like this. Bring this one to you. Uh, this is yours. This is a. Uh, okay, this is for the Fresno. I got the Fresno Food Bank information that needs to be filled up. Fresno, sent to Fresno. All right. So, what were we talking about last week? Be quiet on me now. Identifying scriptures. Yes. We were in Psalms 1. Yes. Psalms 1. Yes. And we're going to go back to Psalms 1. Amen. Because what I want to do is from this parable, I want to work with this parable that you can understand how to go in and to really look at the Word of God, okay, and be able to make it, make it dissect it. I have a couple of people that didn't get paperwork last week. There, if you can see that they get those from me, I appreciate it. Um, Marissa and Delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen. Okay, it starts out and it says, blessed. Okay. 
is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. All right? Father God, we thank and we praise you for this evening. And as we come before you, Lord God, we thank you that you will lead and guide us, Lord God. We thank you for illumination and revelation of your holy and divine word. That we're able to receive this word, Lord God, and apply it to our lives. Able to share it with others and their lives will be better. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will lead us and direct us tonight. God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. You guys, you guys have your... Your paperwork, but I don't have it. No, I'm good. I, I, I got it. But I want to need you to walk along with me to tell me where we're at. All right? It says, bless. Oh, that's, that's, that's the one I need. I just need that one page. All right. Thank you, Jesus. It's my provider. It's my provider. Praise God. Y'all to stay for Bible study. <laughs> yeah, that's really what you do. I know. Uh, 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 thank you. All right. I love you too. Uh, yes, uh, come in late again in a room Bible study, and then you can't stay. Praise God. Uh, 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 I know you're gonna get me later. Uh huh. We'll get around. All right. First of all, I told you. What did I say this was? It's on your paper. Allegory. Absolutely correct. Allegory. All right. And what is an allegory? Figurative language. Figurative language. And look at the solution that I gave you down there where it says figurative language. And then it says figurative language plus images and languages. Okay. Now, an allegory has images in it. It gives you pictures of something. All right. And it has a language which, like what we see here, shall be like a tree. All right? That shows you it's an allegory. All right? Plus, compare and contrast. All right? To compare and contrast, that means that you're going to look at this, you're going to make a contrast to something else. You're going to compare it to something else. In verse 3 it says, he shall be like a tree. That, that's comparing him to something else. Now you have to contrast what a tree is. Okay? Alright? And after you've done these things, you must get, what's the last stage? Allegory with meaning. Okay? Allegory with meaning. That's the purpose of you doing all of these. All right, the, we, the reason that this is put here, figurative language plus image, language plus compare and contrast equals. I did it this way because it's like a formula. After you do these things, you should have the meaning to that allegory. Okay? In all your Bible study, in all Bible studies, you need to do three steps. And it's inductive study. You need to observe what is there. You need to observe what is in that scripture. Read it. And before you go any further, let that scripture speak to you. Just look at it. Line by line, word by word, let it speak to you. Okay? Blessed. Okay? And if you notice on your paper, if you look down, I have a star over blessed. The places where I put the star because I wanted to identify some words that stand out in the scripture. Okay? Blessed is. Alright? Now you want to see who is blessed. Come on. In the scripture. The man. The man. The man represents you. Okay? Now, when you see this man, you have to understand that in 85 to 90 percent of the places where you see the word man in the Old and the New Testament, okay, it is speaking not about gender, it is speaking about mankind, all right? But now when you come over into the book of uh, like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, it is speaking about the male, and there is a different word for that. That's why it's so important to look it up. 
because a lot of times things have been taught where it says man and it was taught that a woman wasn't to be involved but if you look that word up it wasn't speaking about a woman okay because and, and we'll go to where some some people believe that women shouldn't be in the ministry women shouldn't be pastors women shouldn't be you know uh, uh, evangelists because they say that that's the man's role okay but now that is contrary to scripture itself because if you go back in the scripture you look at and we can go into the New Testament where you have a, a Aquila and uh, Aquila and I'm trying to think of the other name Aquila and Priscilla that's husband and wife these were ministers of the gospel you have where they talk about prophecies in the New Testament okay these are women the very first woman that took the very first evangelistic message was a woman the very first evangelistic message after the resurrection of Jesus Christ was Mary when Jesus said go tell my disciples so if it was God's intent for a woman not to carry the message of the gospel as a preacher a teacher okay an apostle or a prophet all right, or an evangelist he would not have used Mary see it's too much contrary to that that's the reason that we have to seek these things out and we have to look at scripture we have to dig into it and see is it saying that you know what does it mean when it says a woman shall not speak in church if you take that see if you take that literally all right, without searching it out if you take it literally without searching it out then you feel that you're in error when women are speaking in the church whether it be behind the pulpit or if you're sitting in the pew if you open your mouth so that could not be for that particular situation what we find in that situation is this what we find in that situation there were some certain things going on in that particular time See, you have, you have to understand that when you're reading scripture, you have four gaps. You have the linguistic gap, which is the language gap. You have the history gap, because history is different. You have the psychological gap, because you know what? They thought different than we did. All right? And you have the, um, oh, it'll come to me in a minute, but you have four. It'll come to me in a minute. Oh, you yeah. have linguistic history, culture. You yeah, have the culture gap. Because their cultures are different. So we have to look into these things to get an understanding. That's why the Bible says, study to show yourself approved of workmen that need him not be ashamed. Okay? And it's very important for us to do that. Now coming back here to uh, Psalms 1. It says, blessed. Alright? Now, 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 let's talk about that. Bless. What does it mean? <coughs> Somebody give me some, you know, some definition. To be favored. Speak up, I can't hear you. To be favored. All right, to be favored. She the only one that can give me an answer? Come on now. Being in a good place, condition, okay? Think about it, people. We use that word so much, all right? People say, I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. God bless you, okay? We need to know what it means. We need to know what, not, not what we gave it the meaning of, what God intended the meaning of, okay? So let me go over here, let me... See if I can get over here real quick. What about happy? Happy? Peace. Peace. Covered, See, what you're doing now is what you should be doing when you're reading the Word. You should be stopping thinking about it. I remember hearing a person tell me once uh, a couple of years back that I don't 
really prepared for a message. I just step in and, and let the Holy Ghost go. Well, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost will bring back to your remembrance, right? You got to have something in your head to bring back to your remembrance. Okay? You really do. You know, there is a preparation that needs to be done before you... See, you prepare your food before you give it to your kids. You just don't give it to them all, right? So if the Bible says that we're feeding his flock, then we should prepare that food before we just dump it and give it to somebody. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's so important now that we as a body of Christ start taking the ignorance out of the church. See, even Paul said, I, have you, I, I would have you not ignorant, brother. See, he even said, why? It's because we have too much of that in the church. Okay, we're looking at that word blessed. All right, let me get over here and let's see what we're talking about here. The Hebrew word for that is Esther. E-S-H-E-R. And we're going to look at what it means. And in the Strong's, it is 835. It means happiness. It means happiness. It also means satisfied. So now we see that this man, the blessed man, is happy and he's satisfied. Alright? But why is he happy and he's satisfied? Let's look at this scripture some more. It says, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel. Counsel we know is advice information of the ungodly. So many times in our life we take we take information from people that that that, that are just heathens. Knowing that they, you know they don't mean no harm. Alright? Some of them. They don't mean no harm. But they give you information that is not in line with the way you're to live your life. You know exactly it's tax time. Somebody that has no integrity does not feel that it's wrong to lie on their taxes. But a person with integrity and a person that is living for God is not going to do that. So when Uncle Joe tells you, oh, just go ahead, you know, and tell him that you know you got an RV and, 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 it's, and, and you won't have no RV and it's a recreational vehicle. Well, let me share something with you. Years back, I had a friend of mine, Christian brother. <laughs> he did that. Four or five years he did that. And for some reason or other, it wasn't for some reason or other, his name came up to be audited. And he called and he said, oh man, and that's why I found out what he had done. And I said, man, the only thing you can do is tell the people the truth. I said, you got a regular van and you've been carrying that thing as an RV, as a recreational van. And I said, you know, just give, you know, the Bible said, give seasons what seasons. So whatever you do, just give it to the people. But see, the Bible says your sin will, what? Find you out. See, so we have to understand that we are children of God. We, we have a different standard. We're called to a different standard. So certain things we can't do. Yeah, it might bring you two, three thousand more dollars, but... In the long run, it's going to cost you more than that. You see what I'm saying? So it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, ungodly does not just mean somebody that has not given their life to Christ. All right? We have some ungodly Christians. They are Christians, but they're not living their life. All right? As far as what the scriptures tell us, the way we're to live our lives, they're not walking in love. They're not trying to, 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 to surrender their lives. So you can't take advice from that kind of person. I mean, we have a lot of people that go around, you know, prophesying to people. And their lives are tore up. Tore up from the floor up. And I mean, if you're going to be an example, your life has to be an example before people. You see, because the Bible says that our lives are living epistles. 
when people are hurting, when people are going through things, they don't need a worldly solution. They need a biblical solution. You know, it's so, it's so, it, 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 it's so strange how you have Christians and a person will be sick or have some kind of uh, infirmity in their body, and the first thing, the first thing they tell you. You need to take this. You need to take that. Instead of praying for that person Amen. and then telling them to get something, they immediately go to the world's medication first. Okay, yes, they need to. They, they may need to take some, you know, some some nasal drops. They may, may need to take some uh, 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 headache medication. But first, at least pray with them. Direct them in prayer before you make a, just a suggestion and just come out and say, we're going to get you some of them aspirin. Because what you're giving them is the world's way first. As Christians, we pray for them. That's what we do. We pray for them first. We stand and we believe for them. And then we say, baby, you know what? Now go ahead and get you some aspirin or whatever. And you remind them, you know, it's going to come a day that your faith is going to be strong enough and you're going to be in a place that when you lay hands on yourself it's going to go just like that. Because now what you're doing, you're guiding them, you're directing them. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. Now the path means that you're, you know, that means that you're just not hanging around wrong people. See, there's a difference when you're going to minister to certain people. You, you know, you're going there for an objective to minister. But if every time somebody sees you, you're always with worldly people, pretty soon they start to question whether you're saved or not. You see what I'm saying? You know, but we have to be around people that are in the world. We work around people that are unsaved. We're going to go minister in places where people are unsaved. But you're on a function. You're doing a job right there. And at that point, once that is over, you need to be found around saints. This is the problem with so many Christians. And I say Christians. Is that they spend more time with the world than they do with the body of Christ. They spend more time with TV than they do reading the Word. And then they want to know why their life is tossed upside down. Look at what you're doing. You know, it's, it, 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 it's, 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 only, it's only natural if you're walking in the snow barefooted that you're going to get snow bite, uh, frost bite, okay? It's eventually going to happen. Well, if you're only talking what the world talks, then you're only going to get what's coming out your mouth. You've got to be in the house of God. Why do you think God made the church? You are the church, but he has designated buildings for you to come to. And then he has five fingers. It's called five fingers of God. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. The five fingers of God. Why? It's to build you up for the work of ministry. You see what I'm saying? But you'll never get built up if you don't get to the house of God. That's why it has to be a priority. It has to be a priority. You know, that's the difference when you see most most midweek services, I don't care whose church it is, most week, week, midweek services never run the same capacity as a Sunday service. It's always a lower capacity. And a lot of that is because people are working, different things, they have different reasons. But the majority of that is, is that people won't commit to the midweek service. Okay? And they think that when they come in, that all they need is that hour or that hour and a half on Sunday to get them through life. That's not so. That's not so. That's why on the midweek Bible study, we're able to get down like we're doing now into more of the Word than we can really on a Sunday. Okay? Because that's why it's called Bible study. And that's why Sunday's called worship service. It's a difference. It says, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but he is. Now who is the he is? 
Who is the head? Everybody, come on, pay attention. Now, who is the, who is the head? Can I hear it from everybody? Or, 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 we have to pray for some The man. Who? Come on. The man. The man. The man is the head. So, you can look at it like this. But the man delights. All right? What does it mean to delight? Enjoy. That's a, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. That man enjoys the law of the Lord. In other words, that man enjoys the word of God. He enjoys it. See, then why do you enjoy something? Because you know it's beneficial for you. It's good to you. That's the way the word has to be to you. It has to be good to you. It has to be something that you enjoy doing. And the only way that you're going to enjoy doing that is when you get to know God. See, stop and think about this. When you, when you met your husband or your, or your wife or your boyfriend or whoever, when you met them, you spent time with them because you enjoyed being with them. You enjoy spending that time together. Okay? So you look forward to times to spend together. Okay? Well, if you treat God the same way and get to know Him, you're going to enjoy spending time with Him. You're going to enjoy getting into His Word. It says, but His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in His law, alright, in His law, God's law, He meditates. Okay, he meditates. Now that word meditate is used again over in Joshua 1 and, 1 and 9. It's either 1 and 8 or 1 and 9. But it does not mean to do it like yogurt. Where you go. It doesn't mean that type of meditation. That word means that you're speaking the word lowly to yourself. That's exactly what it means. That you're speaking the word. It goes beyond just thinking. It means that you're speaking the word. Now why would God use that word? Is because when you speak that word, you're putting that word into your atmosphere. You're putting it into your atmosphere. Okay? And that's where the word needs to be. You know, there have been times that you know what, I know I have and probably been in you that, that are sitting here tonight and listening to me over the internet, is that you have walked in a house where there has been a serious argument. And they weren't arguing at that time, but you just walked in and you knew something wasn't right. And you was like, man, what's happening? You know, and they all oh, we just had a little disagreement. Well, those words were so heavy still in the air that you were able to walk in and recognize that. But that's why it's so important for you to speak positive words about yourself. Okay? See, that's where, where so many young girls, they get twisted is because they're looking for love, okay, and the first guy that comes along and tells them, oh, you look good, oh, da, 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 you know, they want to hear this. Why? It's because they want to be loved. See, God has created in every one of us a place for us to want to be loved. But in order for us to recognize love, we must understand first God's love. Because then you won't you won't receive a counterfeit. Amen. Look at the money you spend. Boy, you know a counterfeit now. And with the big old red president, it can't trick you now. Why? It's because they want to identify the counterfeit. You have to teach the young ladies. You 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 you, you seniors in the church, and when I say seniors, I'm not talking about in age, I'm talking about that have been in the church a while, you need to take some of these young ladies up under your wing. Stop being so selfish. You know, stop being so sharp. Take them up under your wing and teach them. Because they really don't know. You know, a lot of the men, you need to take, you need to take your, 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 your daughters, your nieces, if you don't have daughters, you need to take them out to dinner and show them properly how they're to be treated. So they can recognize, you understand me, how they're to be treated. They don't settle for a twinkie. Okay? And be happy about it. You have to teach them that they're of value. You have to teach them 
Just because this person has an expensive car, that doesn't mean anything. You can have your own expensive car. And in today's world, you have more women today that are better off than a lot of men now. It's not like it was in the 50s and the 60s. See, when I was growing up, my daddy used to say, I'm, I'm the breadwinner in the house. I'm the breadwinner, so everything, you know, wrapped around here. Now it's not the same. See, and when I talk about culture, the culture gap, think about it. In their culture, it was different. In ours, it's different. So you have to understand the culture gap. And he says he, may, he shall meditate in it, what? Day and night. Day and night. My God, that's constantly. He ain't asked you to give no break. <laughs> you know, he said day and night you should be thinking about the world. Yeah. You know, you're washing dishes. You know what you should, you know, you're, you're in the kitchen, you're washing dishes. Put you up a scripture that you want to memorize somewhere where you can see it. While you're washing dishes, look at it. Say it. Take your three by five cards, throw it in your bathroom, put it on your mirror. You get up in the morning washing your face. You're looking at it. Because when you're doing this, you're actually getting this word into you. You're getting it into you. And that's what you have to do. You have to, you have to, you have to be determined. Yes. Determined. When you sit down and eat, oh, you be determined, don't you? Yeah, you be determined. I mean, we went somewhere, Bev and I, and, 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 and ordered something. We were going to Bible study that time. Ordered something, and I could I, I had my mouth fixed for that uh, 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 chicken fried rice. And, and, and I was going to eat it before we went to Bible study, because I usually get there a little bit earlier at this particular Bible study so we could, you know, grab something to eat. We sit in the car and we had in the bag. As we were driving, there wasn't no forks up in there. Oh, oh man, you know what? I turn around and went all the way back. I need a fork. This ain't waiting to go home. <laughs> Why? Because I was determined to eat. You have to be that determined about you feeding yourself. It says, should be like a tree. Now, this is where we come into the analogy. All right? The allegory. All right? Shall be like is always a key to show you that it's an allegory. Because when it says she'll be like, now it's going to tell you what it's going to be like. She'll be like a what? A tree. Well, we know you're not a tree. You automatically know that. So what is he? He's talking to you about something. She'll be like a tree. And he stops right there. So now as you're reading, what is a tree? A tree grows, it grows deep, and it grows high. But what a lot of people do not understand in regards to a tree is the fact that a tree is just as deep as it is high. If you see a hundred foot tree, excuse me, don't throw that at uh, young man, don't throw that no more. If you see a hundred foot, if you see a hundred foot high tree, the roots are also 100 foot. So when you think about a tree, think about how deep the roots are. So if you're like a tree, you need to be rooted in the Word of God. You need to be rooted in God. You truly do need to do this. It says, and she'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now it's going to be, it's planted. A tree doesn't plant itself, does it? So it's going to require someone to plant it. And in this case, it's going to be God. Because your, 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 your roots are deep. Now God is going to put you by the rivers of living water. Why? It's because you need that water to survive. So he's going to put you next to a river flowing. That means movement, constant movement. All right? So this is what uh, we're talking about your life. You need to be deeply rooted in God. You need to be planted by God. 
And see, that, and, and you can look at it this way. There's a lot of people, they get planted at a particular church, but they can't stay. Something happens, goes wrong, they get upset, and, and, and what do they do? They go to another church. We call it a vagabond spirit. That's what it is. Because every time you get upset, you move. Well, that first church that you left, if you weren't released from there, and you're constantly going from here to here to here to here, look, you're not going to grow. You are not going to grow. And every person knows where they need to be because they know by the way the Holy Ghost witnesses in them. The Bible says, try every spirit. You know. But see, this is what makes the difference in those that will be planted by the rivers of water than those that want to plant themselves somewhere. Now, hold on a second. Now. I want you to come over here and sit down. Uh -huh. Sit down. I'm in the middle of ministering. You come out here, I want you to sit down. Okay? Don't ever have me stop ministering. All right? Again. Okay, sweetheart? All right, you do what you do and you come in here and sit down put this light on. You. Put these down and go ahead and sit down. It says, planted by the rivers of water that brings, uh, let's go back up. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit. So there, it shows that this tree has its own fruit. And it shows that this tree is planted by the rivers of water to produce. They're to produce. Okay? So, if you're not producing, then you need to check where you're planting. You know, and really, are you rooted in here? You see what I'm saying? Because, see, you can look at this scripture, and you can go all the way back to Genesis, where it says, he created, let me read it to you. Genesis chapter 1. said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. So he created you to be fruitful and to multiply. You see what I'm saying? But now if you stop and think about the fig tree of Jesus cursed, the reason he cursed it because it wasn't producing. Everything is to produce. Everything. Not only produce, look what it says. To be fruitful and multiply. These are two different actions. Not only are you to be fruitful, he didn't say add to, he said multiply. And if you really stop and look at this scripture, he hadn't even created Adam at this time when he spoke this. Hello. Hello. He had been created. He put it in the atmosphere before Adam was even created. Let's see. Let's go over here and let's see. Because if you go to Genesis 2.15, this is where Adam is created. It says, Then the Lord took then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. Well, let's go back up a little bit. It's uh, 2 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. This is where he creates him at. So he speaks this word before he even forms. Now, notice when he said, go back to 26. I mean 28. 
Go back to 28. Let's look at it. Then he said, then, then God blessed them. All right, Adam wasn't created. So we know if Adam wasn't created, Eve wasn't created. Then God said to who? Them. They weren't even here. But see, you have to understand what God has already ordained already exists. See, that's what we can't understand. That. That's why, see, see, there is no tomorrow with God. It's only one thing we got. See, there's no time frame in the spirit. See, when he when he created the earth, he created you. Why? Because he spoke you into existence. Because see, when it says he sat down, he was finished. There was no need for him to do any other creation. Because he was finished with his work. Now everything that comes into existence comes from his spoken word. You see what I'm saying? That's why the word of God is so important. That's why the devil wants you to not think on the word of God. Think on everything else. Because if you think on the word of God, you're going to speak the word of God. See, the reason a lot of people can't change their life because they never change the way they think. If they change the way they think, they'll change the way they live. See, stop and think about it. I said this once before. President Obama when he was nine years old, whatever he was, he was all oh, he was President Obama at nine years old. He was just walking into his future that was already ordained. You see what I'm saying? The people around him just didn't know he was President Obama until God manifested it. But from the time that he was a baby, he was President Obama. The same with Bush, the same with every president, the same with, they were already there, they just had to wait until the time of manifestation. Your greatness is already there. Your greatness, your success is already there. It's already there. But you have to start speaking it out. You have to start saying it out. When you start speaking it out, when you start saying it out, when you start keeping your mind focused on it, you're going to see the manifestation of it. Why do you think when you look at a cook, uh, 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 a cake box, okay, when you look at a cake box, you see the cake on the outside. You see the already made cake on the outside. Because they're giving you a picture of the finished product. You see what I'm saying? You need to have a picture of the finished product in your head of your life. Of your life. You already, you need to already see everything you want in this year. Already. Not waiting for December to see what you've received. You need to see it already. Your car, your promotion, your job. You need to see it already. See, that's what God said in, 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 in Romans 4, 17. Calling those things which be not as though they were. You're speaking it. Every woman that has a child had to have first a seed. It's called a sperm seed. Every woman. Because without that seed, there would be no child. Without a seed, for your future, there will be no future. You have to be impregnated with your future. You have to be impregnated with your with, 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 with your destiny. Why? Because you're carrying it. And it's going to come to pass if you carry it. But what a lot of people do, they, they abort their own destiny. They abort their own future. Alright? How do they do that? Getting sidetracked. Listening to counsel of the ungodly. Standing in the way of sinners. This is how they abort their own future. And they do it time and time again. Why? Because they're looking for the quick way. They think life is moving too quick for them and, and they got to get theirs now. So the first person that comes along with, 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 with words that sound tantalizing and, 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 and it's going to be applied to their future, they grasp on that. That's the same thing that happened to Eve. 
So he came up, he said, hey, Edie, how you doing today? Beautiful day. Because evidently they had to be talking because she was not afraid of him. So they get in this conversation and he asks, as God said, let's, let's go ahead and look at it because we need to look at it. This is probably as far as we can go tonight after we finish with this. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now listen to this. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And he asked this question, Has God, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, see, he comes to you like that, too. Has God indeed said that you are going to enjoy your future, enjoy your life? After all the things that you have done, how do you think he's going to do that? See, that's a cunning way of doing it to get you to think negatively of yourself. Think about all those things that all the people have said throughout your life. My goodness. All of them couldn't have been wrong. And you're sitting there listening. Why? It's because this conversation seems like it's making sense. But it's not in line with God's word. That's why over in 2 Corinthians it says that we're to cast down every imagination that would exalt itself against God. Not some of them, everyone. Now that in itself is exalting itself against what God has said about you. He goes on and says, And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the, of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Because see, the serpent had enough sense to know that this woman and this man being created by God were, were eternal beings. So in that aspect, he knew that her spirit would not die. See, so he was getting her to tempt God. Then he goes on to say, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. Knowing good for evil. Now doesn't the book of James say, Tempt you, don't be tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life? Here it is right here. You're seeing it right here. The lust of the eye, the fruit look good. The pride of life, you're going to be smart. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing it right there in the Garden of Eden. So when the woman saw mm -hmm, that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, a tree desiring to make one wise, there it is, all three of them right there. She took of it and ate. And also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. See, Innocence was gone now. Innocence was gone. Because their eyes are open. See, prior to that, there was no shame in them walking around naked. There was none. But now the moment that they did this, and it says their eyes were open, shame came in. See, the devil gave them something to do to bring shame into their life. Okay? See, a lot of times the devil will remind you of things that you have done in the past that, 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 that will try to bring shame in your life. You have to know that everything in your past is under the blood. 
Everything in your past is under the blood. Everything in your future is under the blood. You see, and that's, see, why it's under the blood is because the blood of Jesus is thick enough where God can't see that foolishness no more. See, he can't see it no more. See, that's, that was the purpose that they had to keep doing atonement because the blood of them animals kept wearing off of them sin. And God could smell the stench and see the wrong. So they had to do it every year to keep the blood on it. But that's why when Christ came, we moved from atonement to remission, the wiping away of it. Why? Because it's all gone. It ain't never coming back. Not like it was in the Old Testament. So what am I saying? I'm saying what I said in Psalms 1. 1. Blessed are you because you do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor do you stand in the way of sin, nor will you ever seek have a seat with the scornful. But your delight is in the law of the Lord. And you enjoy meditating in it day and night. Why? Because you delight in the law of the Lord. That's why you meditate day and night. And then he goes on and say, That tree, which is you, shall bring forth your fruit in your season. You have a dedicated season. See, all you got to do is stay by the water. That's all you got to do. Stay rooted and stay by the water. And you got a designated season. See, see, that shows his season. It's a personal season. Waterbirds may not grow at the same time as tomatoes. So because you see somebody next to you getting blessed, don't trip off of that. Just know that your season is coming. And his leaf shall not shall not wither. Those are the things that extend from you. Your business. Your children. Everything that extends from you. Because what does a leaf stop? I told you I want you to start looking at this scripture and, 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 and asking yourself, what does a leaf do? A leaf brings in moisture to feed the tree. It brings in oxygen for the tree. Okay? But it says your leaf will not wither. A leaf is part of the branch. Right? What does John 15 say? I am the vine, you are the branch. You see what I'm saying? See, the word of God always ties in together. John 15, 1. It says... And shall not wither. Now here's the application. Because remember I told you. That when you're doing inductive study. There are three steps. Observation. After you observe what you see in the scripture. Now it's time for you to interpret what you see. Now after you have observed and interpreted what you see. Now it is the question you ask. How do I apply this in my life today? See that's the final thing. Now you see the application in the last part of this very verse right here. It says, And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's the, that's the application. And you see the results is prospering. Now you see how we you see how we went through this scripture? This is the way I want you to study your word. This is the way I want you to study your words. Don't just pull one scripture out of the middle of a text. Read into that text. Read after that text. Find out what's happening around. Find out what's happening around you. Okay? Because when you find out what's happening around you, now you have a better idea of what's going on. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Ungodly counsel. Yes, and that's how you do that. Ungodly counsel. 
And see, this is what happens to so many. See, the Word of God, that's why it says in, 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 in Hebrews 4 and 12 that the Word is alive and it's quick. All right? What it means is the Word is alive is that it shows you, just like, a, or just like with life, how to live your life. How to live your life. See, you young people in here today, you need to, you need to really make sure that you get into the Word. And you know I'm talking directly to you. You get into the Word. Because at your age right now, you get into that Word, you stand on that Word, and you start trusting God. You have whatever you want in your heart. Because the Bible says He'll give you a heart's desire. He will bring it to pass. Okay? Stop settling for third and fourth best. You know, stop willing always companionship before you have the companionship of the Holy Ghost. Get the companionship of the Holy Ghost. And then you'll be very selective about the companionship in your life. There's no need to sit there and keep letting people come in and out of your life abusing your emotions when God wants to love you in such a special way. And I'm telling you, you get a hold of the Word of God, and your, your whole life will be different. It's not going to happen overnight. You can't come on one Sunday, and then they'll come back five months later, and then think something's going to happen. That's like going to the doctor. He takes take some medication three times a day, and then you want to take it every other month. Well, when your head falls off, it's supposed to fall off. He told you to take it three times a day. <laughs> Amen. Is there any more questions? Well, at this time, we're going to have the offering. Then we'll close and we'll be out. And don't forget, yes, ma'am. Can we do prayer, some prayer for some people, too? You have the name? Um, yes. You have it written down? Um, yeah, one, one um, you know, like my little cousin, I want, how is it like when you stand proxy? Stand proxy. Um, you know Chanel that usually comes. Okay. Like she's just in the like a little like a suicidal life. Okay. Um, and then, no, ain't no little suicidal. You either got a suicidal <laughs> tendency or you don't. Um, and then housing. And then today I called about the apartment.